All right, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 23. The title to our message this morning is, I will harden his heart. And as you're turning there, please remember what Jesus said, that if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please, Let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt. For all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey I went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. May God bless the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the precious promises in your word, one of which is that if we draw near to God, that you will draw near to us. So Lord, here we are with your people on your day um, in your house, and we pray that, Lord, as we have drawn near to you, Lord, that you would draw near to us now by the power of your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. So Moses just left Mount Horeb, and to understand these verses before us, we need to ask the question, what is Moses going to face when he goes back to Egypt? What is Moses going to face when he goes back to Egypt? And the answer is fierce opposition. Pharaoh, who is the the head of the serpent, the head of the serpent on earth, is going to threaten him, he's going to blaspheme God, and he's going to pour out more abuse upon Israel. What we're going to see is that Pharaoh does not even concede one time. Now certainly at the end of the story, Pharaoh does let Israel go, but he quickly changes his mind and pursues them to try to kill them. So Yahweh is sending Moses into a situation where the enemy will never concede. He'll never give up. I would suggest to you that that's what we face every time that we leave Mount Zion and then descend into the world. We face that same fierce opposition. I don't want to overstate the case. I don't know what it's like outside of America, but I know that here the opposition seems to be increasing all the time. In 2023, we read headlines on a daily basis that would seem unimaginable just 10 years ago. We couldn't have imagined this type of opposition, and neither could Moses have imagined the type of opposition that he would have faced. I mean, he did... Ten miracles. He turned the Nile into blood. He called forth frogs onto the land and gnats and flies and pestilence. He called boils upon the people, hail from the heavens, locusts from the east. 
uh, a suffocating darkness uh, and the death of the firstborn. Egypt was brought to her knees, and yet Pharaoh, in spite of all of this, would not concede. He continued his opposition against Moses. And so, getting inside of Moses' head, we're asking, what would have been the temptation for Moses in the face of all of this opposition? I would suggest to you it would be this. God, this isn't working. You sent me on this mission, and the opposition is only getting worse and worse. And I think that's the temptation for the church today, especially in America. We look at, um, we look at the land, we see that our economy is being destroyed, we see that our youth are being mutilated, we see that Families are being shattered, and the temptation uh, is, God, this gospel thing isn't working. Things are worse than ever. And it's precisely at this point in our passage where God pulls back the veil, and he tells us a deep truth that we desperately need to hear. He's behind the opposition. Look at verse 21. I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. As Reformed Christians, we can all say that that God is absolutely determining the outcome of this opposition. He determines who will win. But here in this passage, he is saying he's determining the opposition itself. Why did Pharaoh oppose Moses so fiercely? Because God hardened his heart. Why is Christ's loving rule so opposed today? Because God has hardened hearts. Why did Moses need to hear this? Why do we need to hear this I mean, if you think about it, it's perplexing because God didn't need to reveal this at all. He could have just kept it secret. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord. He doesn't tell us everything. Well, then why tell us this? Why tell us that he hardens whomever he wills? Because he wants to arm us with an invincible truth that he is in control of even the most wicked It's not the gods of Egypt, it's not the gods of human choice, it's not the gods of wokeism that control planet earth today. It is Yahweh, the most high God. So here is our big idea this morning. I know it's not in your passage, so I'll read it a couple times. Yahweh judicially hardens the hearts of sinners thus revealing to all thus revealing that all opposition is under his rule yahweh judicially hardens the hearts of sinners thus revealing that all opposition is under his rule if you didn't get that we'll see it again in our doctrine section let's begin So beginning in chapter 4, we saw that Moses started bringing objections. He did not want to go back to Egypt. So his first objection was that Israel would not believe him in verse 1. So God gave three miraculous signs to show Israel. His second objection was that he wasn't a good speaker. We saw that in verse 10. God answered by saying, I'm the one who made man's mouth, and your success will not be determined by what you say, but by my power. And then finally, Moses begged the Lord to send someone else in verse 13. God here was angry with Moses, but in his grace, he sent a mediator, his brother, to join him. So we see very clearly that the state of Moses' heart in chapter 4 is that he is fearful. He is reluctant to go on such a great task. 
And that's the important backdrop for our verses. Moses begins his mission with a heavy heart. And so what God does is he provides four uh, notes of encouragement as an antidote. So consider encouragement number one, Jethro tells Moses shalom. Encouragement number one, Jethro tells Moses shalom. Look with me at verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. Let's stop there for a second. I think that this explanation here is a bit puzzling on Moses' part. Is Moses lying to Jethro? Is he hiding his mission from him because he's afraid what Jethro would say? I don't think so. It seems to me that Moses is expressing his same fearful heart. He is full of doubt. And so he's asking permission from his father-in-law, the, also the father of his wife and the grandfather of his children, if he can go on this, this questionable journey. What does Jethro tell him? End of verse 18, Jethro says to Moses, go in peace. The Hebrew word is shalom. It means welfare, health, and prosperity to you. So this is the first encouragement that Yahweh gives Moses. Uh, Jethro doesn't just merely give him his permission. He blesses him with shalom. Encouragement number two. God tells Moses that the danger is gone. Encouragement number two, God tells Moses that the danger is gone. Please look with me at verse 19. The Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt. For all the men who were seeking your life are dead. I remember 40 years earlier, Moses had killed the Egyptian in Exodus chapter 2, and Pharaoh then went, the old Pharaoh, went to search for his life, to put him to death. And so apparently this is still a concern on Moses' part. He's scared apparently. But Yahweh tells him here that all of his enemies are dead and the danger is gone. That's the second encouragement. Encouragement number three, Moses possesses the staff of God. Moses possesses the staff of God. Look with me at verse 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. Stop there for a second. With, with the news of his enemies being dead, Moses now feels safe enough not just to go himself, but to take his whole family with him. But look at what he has in addition. End of verse 20. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. In, in Beginning of uh, chapter 2, 3, I think. It was just called Moses' staff. It was just a shepherd's staff. But now it's the very staff of God. And this staff is mentioned in nearly every miracle that Moses performs. So he's returning to Egypt with the very instrument that would unleash the power of God on earth. That's the third encouragement that Yahweh gives Moses. Encouragement number four, Pharaoh's heart is in God's hands. Pharaoh's heart is in God's hands. Let's look at verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I will put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I think the antithesis in this verse is absolutely astounding. Uh, God tells Moses to perform these miracles, miracles that the world has never seen, all the while demanding that Pharaoh let Israel go. And you, you think that the, the rest of the sentence would then be, and then Pharaoh will let him go. But no, the antithesis is this, but I will harden his heart. Now, 
the Hebrew word is that uh, to harden is to make rigid, to, to make stubborn, to, to be obstinate. So God is going to make Pharaoh's heart stubborn and obstinate. And the question is, is how in the world is this an encouragement to Moses? I'm going to make the opposition worse, and that should be an encouragement to you. How is that an encouragement to Moses? Well, because as he faces this opposition, what's going to happen is that Moses is going to start to question He's going to question his whole mission. He's going to question whether God actually spoke to him or not. This is the way of the saints, beloved. Think about John the Baptist for a moment. Uh, John the Baptist was called the greatest man ever born of a woman. When he came on the scene in his ministry, he declared the truth that nobody else declared. In John 1.29, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was on fire for God. And then he got arrested. And then his public ministry came to an end. And then he started to question whether this really was the Christ. He sent messengers to Jesus in Luke 7, 19, asking, are you the one that is to come? I mean, I declared that you were the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but is that really you? Or are we supposed to wait for someone else? See, fierce opposition made John question God. Certainly you've experienced that before. Certainly you have. Opposition so great where you, you question whether you're a Christian, you question whether you're in the right relationships, at the right church, in the right city, at the right job. God, have I gotten it wrong? Because everywhere I turn, I'm being opposed. Every door is shut. How can these things be? If I'm doing your will. And that's precisely what Moses was going to face. And Yahweh is lovingly anticipating this objection in Moses' heart. He says, Moses, Pharaoh will oppose you. But don't question your mission. I'm the one who's hardening his heart. You see, the story of Exodus is, is truly the cosmic battle of the gods. John Currid, in his commentary, explains, quote, Ancient Egyptian texts teach that the heart is the essence of the person. Consequently, this is also what the Bible teaches. Pharaoh's heart was particularly important because the Egyptians believed his heart was the all-controlling factor of both history and society. It, all, it further held that the hearts of the gods Ra and Horus were sovereign over everything. Now, because Pharaoh was the incarnation of Ra and Horus, his heart, therefore, was thought to be sovereign over everything. Yahweh hardens Pharaoh's heart to demonstrate that only the God of the Hebrews is the sovereign of the universe, end quote. Now, 19 times in the book of Exodus, we're going to read that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, 19 times. But not all of these accounts are going to be the same. Three times we're going to read that Pharaoh himself hardened his heart. Exodus 8.15, 8.32, 9.34. Ten times we're going to read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 4.21, 7.3, And then six times we're going to read that Pharaoh's heart was just hardened. And, and it doesn't specify who did the hardening. Exodus 713, 714, 722, 819, 97, 935. And so the question before, here, here's the first time that we're given this, this idea. And the question is, is, well, then who is doing the hardening, Pharaoh or God? And the answer is, is that both of them are. 
Puritan Thomas Manton describes three types of hardness. The first type is natural hardness. Natural hardness. Because of the fall of Adam, all of us are born with stony, hard hearts. And that stony, hard heart can only be removed by the free, saving grace of Jehovah. Exodus eleven nineteen. I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. We are not born neutral or innocent. Uh, exhibit number one, Genesis 19 that we read this morning. I know that some of you were shifting uneasily in your seats as we read this account. Of course, the Bible is not... Um, glossing over the sins of Lot or his daughter or the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're saying, here, see, this is what sin does. So that's natural hardness. Pharaoh began with a hard heart from birth. Secondly, Manton goes on to talk about voluntary hardness. Voluntary hardness. We add to our natural hardness when we rebel against the Lord. Psalm 95, 7 through 8 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Manton says here, quote, When men willingly reject the counsel of God, they increase the hardness of their heart. So Pharaoh, though he was born with a naturally hard heart, the more he rebelled against God, the harder that he willingly made his heart. Exodus 9.34, But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart. Then the third type of hardness is Judicial hardness. Judicial hardness. And this is God's act. This is what we see in our passage. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Or Exodus 9, 12. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So Manton says here that man hardens first and then God hardens as a punishment for sin. A just punishment. So then we arrive now at our doctrine this morning. Yahweh judicially hardens the hearts of sinners, thus revealing that all opposition is under his rule. All opposition is under his rule. Let's consider four proofs of this doctrine from elsewhere in Scripture. Proof number one is Sihon, king of the Amorites. Proof number one. Sihon, king of the Anorites. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 26. Moses also wrote Deuteronomy, and he's recounting the journey of the Israelites uh, towards the promised land, and he tells us of an event that occurred on the way. Deuteronomy 2, verse 26. So I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, let me pass through your land. I will go only by the road. I will turn aside neither to the right nor to the left. How did Sihon answer? Well, look down at verse 30. But Sihon, the king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him for The Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might give him into your hand as he is this day. Now, uh, Numbers 21 tells us that Sihon was the king of the Amorites. Remember, it's the Amorites that had been willingly hardening their own hearts against Yahweh for 430 years, Genesis 15, 16 says. Here, Yahweh is judicially hardening Sihon's heart to bring that just punishment upon them. Proof number two. 
the Canaanite kings. Turn with me, please, to Joshua 11, verse 18. Joshua 11, verse 18, and here we read of Israel's conquests in northern Canaan. Picking up in Joshua eleven eighteen, Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the people of Israel except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. They took them all in battle, for it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction and should receive no mercy, but be destroyed just as the Lord commanded Moses. Proof number three, Israel in the first century. Israel in the first century. Please turn with me to John chapter 12, verse 37. And here, John is giving us a commentary of how the Jews were responding to the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 12, verse 37. Though Jesus had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Real quick, this is the second type of hardness. The Jews were voluntarily hardening their hearts against the Messiah. Picking up in verse 39. Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He, that's God, has blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would Heal them. Because the Jews would not receive Jesus, the very Savior that God sent for them, God judicially hardened their heart to judgment. And then proof number four, the last proof. The Gentile world yesterday and today. The Gentile world yesterday and today. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And here in... In these few verses, we discover what was wrong with the ancient Gentile world and what's wrong with the world today. Starting in verse 18, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. God's angry. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness Suppress the truth. God is angry because men are suppressing the truth. What truth are they suppressing? Verse 21. For although they knew God, they knew God because of his eternal nature and the power that's displayed in creation. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this is the second kind of hardness. They They knew that God was worthy of worship and they hardened their hearts and they refused to give him thanks. And as a result, God judicially hardens the nations. Look in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the disarming of their bodies among themselves. Verse 26, so it gives it three times. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those who are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. What we read in Genesis 19 this morning with the the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was judicial hardening. That's why they did what they did. Verse 28. For since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. This language here in Romans 1 of God giving them up is the same. It's synonymous with God judicially hardening. So so 
in summary, we, we can say beyond disputation that this doctrine is, is all over Scripture. God judicially hardens the hearts of uh, obstinate sinners. And, and beloved, just as Moses needed to hear this, you need to hear this. The opposition that we face in the world today is not evidence that the devil is winning. It's evidence that God is sovereign over the world. And he begins in the hearts of men and women. There's not, he, he's not trying to, you know, the whack-a-mole. He's not trying to make sure all the moles get down. He's holding them down. That's our doctrine, that, that all opposition is part of his perfect plan and a demonstration of his perfect rule. So let's look then at our duty. And our first duty, because this doctrine is so difficult, is to answer two objections. First, someone might say, Well, Pastor Josh, God doesn't actively harden sinners. He just leaves them to their own devices. God doesn't actively harden sinners. He just leaves them to their own devices. How do we answer that? Well, first, by acknowledging there's truth here that that God does, in fact, harden sinners through desertion sometimes. Psalm 81, 11 and 12. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. So it's true that that God's desertion is one way that he judicially hardens hearts. But at other times, he hardens hearts by delivering men over to the power of Satan. Um, he did this with King Saul. In 1 Samuel 16, 14, we read, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. Or in the New Testament, 2 Thess- Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, They refuse to love the truth and so be saved, and therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they may be condemned. So we see that sometimes God hardens by desertion, sometimes God hardens by handing them over to the power of Satan, but sometimes God hardens hearts by his kindness. Uh, Christ, in John 11, shows his kindness to Lazarus by raising him from the dead. Now, what kind of effect should that have on a sane people? We worship you! That's not what happened, was it? The, the Jews hardened their hearts against Christ even more in John eleven forty eight, 48. It says, if we let him, Jesus, go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. You see, the same, the same light from the sun, the same heat from the sun that melts the ice of some sinners' hearts bakes and hardens the clay of others. Um, I don't know if, if God sent Pharaoh over to the power of Satan, but I do know that he showed his kindness to Pharaoh over and over and over again. Um, Manton observes here that, quote, God from the beginning foreknew the hardness of Pharaoh's heart and therefore might have swept him away all of a sudden, but he gave him frequent warnings and convictions, and every judgment is threatened in advance before it is executed. One example of God's kindness to Egypt is before the the plague of the hail. He says, look, and and he he doesn't just tell this to the people of Goshen. He tells it to the Egyptians. I'm going to send hail. Bring your cattle inside so they don't die. Exodus chapter 9, 19. 
But what does this kindness do to Pharaoh? It hardens him all the more. So yes, God sometimes hardens by desertion, but he also hardens by handing man over to Satan and by pouring out his kindness. Secondly, someone might say, but if God hardens men's hearts and they rebel against him, then isn't God the author of sin? How do we answer that? I mean, our own Westminster Confession of Faith says in chapter 3, paragraph 1, that God is not the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures. I think we need to think carefully about that phrase, author of sin. Listen to how, this is, this is why, by the way, I love Jonathan Edwards right here, this quote. Listen to what he says. If by the author of sin be meant the sinner or the agent or the actor of sin or the doer of a wicked thing, then certainly it would be a reproach and blasphemy to suppose that God be the author of sin. But if by author of sin is meant the permitter of sin or not a hinderer of sin for wise, holy, and most excellent ends and purposes, that sin, if it be permitted or not hindered, will most certainly and infallibly follow. I say, if this be all that is meant by being the author of sin, then I do not deny that God is the author of sin. Though I dislike and reject the phrase as that which by use and custom is apt to carry another sense, end quote. I think this is actually fairly easy to illustrate. Uh, children, boys and girls, I know that some of you um, like to uh, write stories that you are authors in the making. And in your writing, you make this character do this and that character do that. You determine what happens in your story, right? Question is, is who wrote the story of the universe? God did. He is the author of history. And so question, is there sin in history? Yes. And God authored that sin into history for his most wise and holy and excellent ends, as Edward says. But that does not make God the actor of sin. Uh, R.C. Sproul, um, I've been holding on to this quote for like 10 years, so... R.C. Sproul says it like this. God did not need to create fresh evil in Pharaoh's heart to redeem his chosen people. There was already enough evil in Pharaoh's heart to last forever. God needed only to withhold from Pharaoh whatever grace was restraining his wickedness and to allow him his way. By doing this, God hardened Pharaoh's so God is not the author of sin in, in a sense that he compelled Pharaoh to sin against his will. But we must affirm that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass, including the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. He wrote that into the story. That brings us then to our second duty this morning. We must examine ourselves. Beloved, is this the God that you serve? That you worship? The God who rules over the hearts of men? Do, do you believe that the potter has the right over the clay to do whatsoever he will? Don't you realize that, that God could have hardened Pharaoh's heart without ever telling us? Why does he tell us? Because he wants us to see it. He, he wants us to see the glory of his rule and control and power over every atom, over every star, over every living soul. He wants us to find strength and joy and comfort 
in the unassailable truth that no rule is above God and no rule is beside God, that our God is in the heavens and that he does whatsoever he pleases, that our God does according to his will amongst the hosts of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Is that the God that you worship, because if so, you can face any opposition. That brings us then to our third duty, to to warn, to warn those who, like Pharaoh, do not serve the Lord. Heed the warning of Pharaoh, if that is you, dear friend. God has given Pharaoh as an example of those who will not serve him. And the Philistines, hundreds of years later, saw this. Uh, the Philistines were Israel's ancient enemies, and they, they learned from the example of Pharaoh. There was an incident where they, they captured the Ark of God, and they stuck it in Dagon's temple, and then Dagon fell over, and his hands broke, and his head broke, and the Philistines didn't know what was going on, so they go to their sorcerers, and they say, hey, what's going on? And this is what these men surprisingly told them. In 1 Samuel 6.6, 6, they say, why should you harden your hearts against the Egyptians? Uh, Sorry, why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh harden their hearts? He dealt severely with them. The sorcerers are saying, learn from the lesson. They hardened their hearts. It brought destruction. If you harden your hearts, it'll bring destruction on you. And so, dear friend, I say to you, what profit could you find in hardening your heart against the Lord? What God do you think will triumph? Are you a match for him? Yeah, now, if you, if you say in response, well, actually, I do want to come to the Lord, but I fear that I've already been judicially hardened and, and it's too late for me. Then I would just say this, dear friend, the Lord has recovered many who have been in such a state. There's hope for you. Call out to him, Lord, I have a stiff neck. I have a proud heart. It's too hard for me to soften it, but you, Lord, can soften my heart. You are the ruler of men's heart. Remove my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. To love you, to serve you, to worship you. And so those are our duties this morning. First of all, we have a duty to answer those objections that come to our mind. Our minds do not get the last word. Scripture does. Secondly, we have a duty to examine ourselves. Is this the God that we worship? The God who rules over every heart. And then thirdly, we have a duty to warn ourselves if we do not serve and love this God. Pharaoh is a warning to all. What happens to those who do not serve the Lord? So let's look finally then at our delight this morning. This passage is a delight. The gospel here is both implicit and it's explicit. We get two layers of the gospel this morning. First, the gospel is implicit. Dear eternal friend. How are you any different than Pharaoh? Pharaoh was born as a sinner with a hard heart towards God. And so were you. Pharaoh willingly made his heart harder through disobedience and rebellion. And dear friends, so have you. You and Pharaoh have the same raw material. And so who made you different? Or as Paul asked in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you did not receive? 
Did, did you make your own heart soft? Dear friends, you did not make yourself a Christian. That's the point. Your heart was hard. You would have never chosen this life on your own. But the goodness and loving kindness of God, your Savior, He appeared to you and He freely and sovereignly took out your heart of stone and replaced it with a heart of flesh. By grace have you been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. The gift of God. God made you a Christian. He made you what you are. You had a hard heart and now you have a soft heart. And the only explanation for it is the free grace of God that's in the gospel. That's how the gospel is implicit in this text. You did nothing to make yourself different than Pharaoh. You, you did nothing to make yourself a Christian in time past. You did nothing to keep yourself a Christian when you woke up this morning, and you will do nothing on the last day when you remain a Christian and stand before God Almighty. It is by the grace of God that you are who you are. And that brings us secondly to how the gospel is explicit in our passage. The Lord tells Moses what to tell Pharaoh when he returns to Egypt. Look with me at verses 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord. Now, this is the first time in Scripture that those words appear. Thus says the Lord, and it's reserved for the most precious truth. Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. You can already see how God is hinting at he has other sons, other nations that he's going to bring to himself. Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Israel is God's son. And Pharaoh enslaved and murdered Yahweh's firstborn son. And now Yahweh is telling him, if you don't let my son go, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. And this, of course, ominously foretells about the 10th plague when, when God kills Pharaoh's firstborn son. And it's that judgment, the death of the firstborn, that set Israel free. And beloved, it's that judgment that sets you free. Not the death of Pharaoh's firstborn son, but the death of Yahweh's firstborn son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God could not overlook the hardness of your heart, your rebellion against him. Someone had to die in your place. Galatians 4, 4 through 5, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus Christ, the firstborn of Yahweh, was slain to set you free. And then he rose again from the dead so that you could be called a son or a daughter of God. So, beloved, receive this charge then as we conclude. Just as Moses was redeemed and sent into Egypt... Uh, without fear, God was arming him. So you can now serve God without fear. So serve him without fear. Uh, Yahweh rules over the opposition that you see today. Just as he ruled over Pharaoh's opposition, so he rules over every hard heart today. So don't despair. Trust in the sovereign ruler of the skies. Sovereign ruler of the skies, ever gracious, ever wise, 
All my times are in your hand. All events at your command. His decree who formed the earth fixed my first and second birth. Now my life him to owe. Where he leads me, I will go. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you reveal deep mysteries to your people. Lord, it is in these very deep mysteries that we can understand the world that you have made, the world that we are in, the fallen world that you are waiting to redeem. And so, God, we thank you. We pray that you would help us to take these truths out into the world today, Lord, when we are at Albertsons, when we go to our job, when, we, when we're sick at home, when we're opening up our news feed, when we see opposition, Lord, remind us of this passage that, Lord, you are in control, not only of outcomes, but of the opposition itself. And remind us, Lord, that you have slain our opposition in the person of your Son. May we sing to him now. May we express our love to God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. We ask these things in his name. Amen.